Good evening. I got that right. <laughs> Every year, I almost say good morning because that's what I do all the other weeks. All right, we're good. I think maybe I should just stop now while I'm ahead, right? <laughs> Merry Christmas. We can say that, right? Merry Christmas. All right, so a couple of items before I begin today or tonight, this evening. Um, we do not have kids church or child care. Um, so it's kind of a nice thing that so many young families are migrating down here to Naples, southwest Florida. But the thing is, some of their families aren't. <laughs> so they come down here and during Christmas they go back up north, kind of a bad time to do that with the weather, and visit their families. So all of our kids, volunteers, are out of town. So what we've done, if you have a little one who might be a little noisy, if you go straight across the lobby, we've just left the kids' area uh, open for you, and I've made sure that they stream the service, the messages being streamed in there. So just go straight across. If you need help, Ed up here, he'll show you. Um, just bother him or anybody. Carol Lee's back there, I think. She'll, yeah, she'll help you. Also, all the way down that hallway, they can show you where uh, the theater, the black box room is. There's a big screen like this one in there, and you can watch it in there if you think that the kids are going to be noisy. Or you can take your chances. And here's the thing. I'm going to warn you about this. Because I heard a story <laughs> about a young boy whose parents insisted that he stay in the service. He was doing pretty good. It was Christmas Eve, and the pastor began to tell the story we're going to tell, kind of the rest of the Christmas story, what happens before Jesus is born. You see, there's John the Baptist first, and you have Elizabeth and Zechariah. They're very old. Well, he's a priest, and he's in the temple, and he's burning incense, and then the angel Gabriel shows up. And he says, you're going to have a son, John. And Zechariah doesn't believe him. And for the lack of belief, he makes him mute. The father can't speak until after John is born. So now this boy is paying attention. And you see, remember, well, if you're, <laughs> you're not new here, you know I've been talking about bickering during the holiday season. A lot of families Fight, fight, and bicker. And so this boy, all the way to church, had been exposed to bickering. His parents were going back and forth and at it, and he didn't have the Sony Walkman, like I said, I had when I was a kid to save him from it. So he had to listen to all the bickering. So his kid's listening to how the fathers made mute. And out loud to the whole church, he says, I want Gabriel to come to our house this year. <laughs> so you've been warned. You've been warned <laughs> at your own risk. So we are going to continue, actually, in our series. We're in the middle of a series, if you're new and you're visiting, called The Rest of the Story. And as a church, what we decided to do a while back is look at all the accounts of the Bible. Do the whole Bible, every gritty detail. And we're seeing that even people who have been in church their whole lives, they're like, are you kidding me? That's in there? I'm like, yeah, there's some pretty crazy stuff. And I'm going to talk about it today a little bit. But we are landing right in the New Testament today in the series. Coincidence? I think not. So we're in the New Testament. We just finished the Old Testament. It seems like we've been in the Old Testament for like three years, but it's probably a year and a half. It's been a long time, and we're working our way through it. And one of the things we're, we're doing and we've been talking about as a church is that for our Christmas services and things like that, and I got called out for using the prefix menu analogy, right? So I'm not going to do that again. But we're going to show you who we are. The problem with a lot of Christmas services is that people come to them and the regular members are like, uh, here we go, like the prefix menu if you really like your favorite restaurant. But the people who come, they may decide to come the next Sunday. No service tomorrow at 10 a.m. New Year's, oh yeah, yes, New Year's Day, right? The first. We'll see who shows up. So <laughs> the first, it's a 10 a.m. service. You should be able to make it by then. But they show up, and here's what they do. They're like, 20-minute mark of the sermon. Why is the pastor still talking? <laughs> you know, 
We don't know these songs. It's so different. <laughs> so this is who we are. We're going to stay right in our series. I'm going to tell you the rest of the Christmas story today. It's going to be fun. The only two things that are a little bit different is this shirt. This is my Christmas shirt. And now with the weather here, I wish I got the flannel one. That's just saying this is like a very thin fabric and it's cold. But I'll warm up because I move around a lot. So, <laughs> so the child care, the shirt, <laughs> and we usually feed everyone after the service. That's what we're about. We're about the word while we're here. This is about the word. We are dedicated to this. But we love gathering together. We love eating together. We're a family church. We want to get to know you. So it's a lot of fun. And if I go a little long, we feed you. You'll live. It's going to be great. But we're not going to go that long today. So today, we find ourselves in the New Testament. So let's hop right in. Now, I've explained to you guys before that the Bible is not in chronological order. You kind of got to hop around a lot. So right at the beginning of the New Testament, you have four gospel accounts. So these are four accounts of really kind of the same thing, the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. But they're told by four different people from kind of four different aspects. So they're not contradictions, what we end up with. They're just different perspectives. They give us different details, and that's a good thing. So you see here, doing it chronologically, if you know anything about the Bible, John is not the first book of the New Testament. It's the fourth. But why is it at the beginning? Well, I'm going to show you. So let's hop right in. We'll look at John 1, in the beginning. So look what it says here. John 1, 1. In the beginning, the Word already existed. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through him, and nothing was created except through him. The Word gave life to everything that was created, and his life brought light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. And then there's a whole bunch of Lord, Lord of the Rings writing right there. It's really weird, right? <laughs> That's ancient Greek. Now, there's a reason I put that up there. Not that I expect anybody except maybe a pastor or two or my Greek friends watching online to read that. But here's the thing. If you know the Bible really well or maybe you have a more traditional version, you might have recognized John 1.1 1, 1 and go, oh, it's a little different. So we are in a one-room schoolhouse. And I like it so that everyone can understand it, no matter how old you are or what your reading level. So usually on a Sunday, I'll preach from an easy-to-read version, so you get the point. And then at Bible study that follows, no Bible study this Wednesday, but there's usually Bible study Wednesday, then we get a little more technical. And here's the thing. Sometimes I'll get guys that come in, especially when they don't like what I say, and they'll go, what version of the Bible was that? You know, it's like the made-up one that you disagree with. I don't know. <laughs> but they come in, and they're like, well, this is the best translation of the Bible. And I did that when I was in pastor school, and I was really arrogant and conceited. So, <laughs> so it's wearing off. But anyway, you know, and I'd say, this is the best translation of the Bible. So now what I hit them with is that I know some Greek. I go, no, that is. Can you read that? No. Shh, quiet. Sit down. So <laughs> what you want to do, you want to go to those more technical translations, or you really do if you're preaching. You want to know the Greek. You want to be familiar with it because if you're making a theological point, it's important because some of the easy-to-read versions, they'll go off a tiny bit. They don't get the story wrong. They're just there to help you to understand what's going on. You want to get technical? you got to go technical, but I'll translate that for you. Essentially... It is like this. In the beginning was the Word. Now, you have to understand, the Word is Jesus. The Word can be the Word of God, or the Word can be Jesus. And this is what John is saying here. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This one was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and apart from him, not one thing became, came into being that has come into being. In him was life, and the life was the light of humanity, anthropon. So it's like, think anthropology, not the store, the people. And the light shines in the darkness. See, we've got the shoppers here. And the darkness did not overcome or comprehend it, right? You're just getting that. That's cool. All right. Yes, I get dragged to the mall once in a while. So... <laughs> <laughs> the word is Jesus. Jesus existed in the beginning. 
He's God. Christians, we worship a triune God, like the song. Father, Son, Holy Spirit in the beginning. In fact, he's in the very beginning of the Bible. You get a trinity. You get a plurality there. Genesis 2. So the Holy Spirit is right there hovering over the waters in creation, right? And see, God says, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, plurality. In the garden, you might know the story, right? About the, it's not an apple necessarily, but right? so Eve, they want to rob from God, from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, to be like God. So they take from that tree, right? Then they get in trouble. So they hear God coming, and it says this. We'll put it on the screen. Genesis 3.8. When the cool evening breezes were blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord God walking about in the garden. So they hid from the Lord God among the trees. Some scholars call this a theophany. It's when God takes on some kind of physical human appearance to man. You could think of it as a Christophany, a prefigure of the incarnate, fancy, Jesus, right? So Jesus is going to come in the flesh, but it's a prefigure of that. Maybe foreshadowing would be a word, but it's a picture of Jesus in the Old Testament. When we get to the New Testament, after Jesus rises from the dead on the Emmaus Road, he runs into some people. He has a conversation, and here's what it says. Then Jesus took them through the writings of Moses and all the prophets, explaining from all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Moses, Genesis, that's all the way in the beginning. He's going, this is me, this is me, this is me, this is me, this is me. From the garden through the prophets. Jesus existed. And so it's appropriate thinking. And if you're new and people are like, this is the God of the Old Testament, this is the God of the New. Eh, wrong. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's never separated from himself. That's bad thinking. So when the prophets, they're speaking on behalf of the Lord, the Lord is Jesus. <laughs> so he's the same, the beginning and the end. And if you read Revelation, he doesn't really change that much. He probably should. So what we celebrate today is the arrival of Emmanuel, God with us, the incarnation. So this is Jesus' birth in the flesh. So he's coming, and as the song said, becoming like us. Now, when we keep going chronologically, put the chart up, we're going to run into some genealogies, and this is what Matthew starts with. So these are the parts that nobody reads, but I'll show you later. They're kind of important. <laughs> so think of it like Jesus' family tree. And so Matthew's going one direction to get to Jesus, from Abraham to Jesus, and Luke is going the other way, from Jesus all the way to Adam, showing that he's from the line of David, as they say, even back to Abraham, even back to Adam. But today, I'm going to show you the rest of the Christmas story. What we're going to do is we're going to overview what is typically taught this time of year. And I want to show you some features, like in that genealogy, of things that people don't normally point out. So in this series, we've talked about John the Baptist a little bit, and I mentioned him earlier in the joke. So he's the one, he's the Messiah's herald. He's going to be pointing the way to the Lord, preparing the hearts for the Lord, preparing a path for the Lord. So Luke gives us a brief introduction, and after that we have John the Baptist and Jesus' birth foretold. So you get that whole thing with Zechariah and Gabriel. He's at the incense altar, and so he sees him. He's scared, but he tells him, you're going to have a son. No way, man. We're too old. Shut up. And so he, <laughs> he's muted just like that. That's exactly how it happened. <laughs> and so he's muted. He can't speak, right? But he's told that John, his son, is going to come with the power of Elijah. So you might remember that from the series. The spirit and power of Elijah. He's going to prepare hearts for the Lord. Pretty big deal. He comes out of the temple. Mm, he can't talk, right? Just like that. And they're like, what? what? Something crazy must have happened. Yeah. So what's worth noting here, and this is kind of interesting because another thing people say about the Holy Spirit, right? He, he somehow arrives and is born on Pentecost, right? Wrong. That's the wrong answer. There's no less than four mentions of the Holy Spirit, like indwelling people or empowering people in the first chapter of Luke. 
It's amazing. And then again, when we get to the second chapter. So you're going to pay attention to that. So John, it says, will be filled with the Holy Spirit. Really interesting. So if we continue along, we see Elizabeth and Mary come into the picture. So Zechariah, Elizabeth, Elizabeth indeed gets pregnant. So she like kind of goes away for five months, <laughs> hidden for five months. Then Gabriel decides to visit Mary in the sixth month of her relative. We don't know about the cousin thing. Relative. <clears throat> so Elizabeth. So it's a six month of her pregnancy. Gabriel comes to Mary and then lets her know you're going to conceive. You're going to have a child. She's like, how? I'm a virgin, right? I didn't do anything to cause that. No, you'll conceive by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amazing. So that's where you get that, let it be unto me. No, Paul McCartney wrote the song about his mom. It's not about Mary, but Mary does say something like that. Anyway, moving on. <laughs> when Mary sees Elizabeth, John hears it in Elizabeth's womb, and he leaps for joy, and it says that Elizabeth is filled with the Holy Spirit. She remains there for three months. She basically has this song of praise that is called, if you're in traditional church, the Magnificat. It's like this big song of praise, kind of like Hannah's prayer in Samuel. If we keep moving along, we get the birth of John. It's now the eighth day, and according to the law of Moses, he's supposed to be circumcised. They ask Elizabeth, what are you going to name him? John. No way. No one in your family is named John. Name him Zechariah. So they ask Zechariah, but, mm, right? So they get him a writing tablet. His name is John. And so they name him John, and presto, he can speak. And this is what he says. Luke 1, 67. Then John's father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and gave this prophecy. Praise the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has visited and redeemed his people. He has sent us a mighty Savior from the royal line of his servant David, just as he promised through his holy prophets long ago. Now we will be saved from our enemies and from all who hate us. He has been merciful to our ancestors by remembering his sacred covenant, the covenant he swore with an oath to our ancestor Abraham. We have been rescued from our enemies so we can serve God without fear in holiness and righteousness for as long as we live. This is about Jesus. Then directs the attention to John and you, my little son, will be called the prophet of the Most High because you will prepare the way for the Lord. You will tell his people how to find salvation through forgiveness of their sins because of God's tender mercy. The morning light from heaven is about to break upon us to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death and to guide us to the path of peace. Prophecy. If we go back to the Old Testament, We'll see a prophecy about this. I want to connect some things for you. So context is difficult. I'll just give it to you quickly. It's about King Ahaz, and he's worried about the king of Israel, Pekah, and the king of Syria, reason to come. They're coming to attack him. He's worried about it, and the prophet Isaiah is saying, don't worry about it. Your line is going to continue. That is the context. Look, ask for a sign. He's like, I don't want to test God. We've talked about that. But Isaiah says, no, just anything. So here's this prophecy, Isaiah 7:14. All right, then, the Lord himself will give you the sign. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. So Ahaz, who this is being said to, is in the genealogy, the family tree of Jesus. It's an assurance that his line will continue. And indeed, it does miraculously until the Messiah comes. So this happens, and if we continue reading in Matthew, we find out how. Matthew 1.18, this is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph. But before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Joseph, to whom she was engaged, was a righteous man and did not want to disgrace her publicly. So he decided to break the engagement quietly. So... You know, just think about this for one second as we just pause on that verse. <laughs> so he's a nice guy, it's saying. Why? Well, maybe they haven't consummated the marriage or anything. And she's like, yeah, I'm pregnant. Right. By the power of the Holy Spirit, it's totally cool. 
Right. <laughs> so, as he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, Do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit, and she will have a son, and you will name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All of this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message through his prophet. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. And so just a little note for you nerds out there. This is the Greek Old Testament, not the Hebrew that is being quoted here. When Joseph woke up, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded and took Mary as his wife. But he did not have sexual relations with her until her son was born, and Joseph named him Jesus. Now, you get a little bit of parallel, but a different perspective if we go back to Luke. Luke 2.1. At that time, the Roman Emperor Augustus decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. This was the first census taken when Quirinius was governor of Syria. All returned to their own ancestral towns to register for the census. And because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea. David's ancient home. He traveled there from the village of Nazareth in Galilee. He took with him Mary, to whom he was engaged, who was now expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for her baby to be born. She gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no lodging available for them. So now, if we go back to John, we get the theological viewpoint. John 1.10 Jesus came into the very world he created, but the world didn't recognize him. He came to his own people, and even they rejected him. But to all who believed him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. They are reborn, not with a physical birth resulting from human passion or plan, but a birth that comes from God. So the word became human and made his home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness, and we have seen his glory the glory of the Father's one and only Son. Now, if we continue, we get the shepherds and the angels. A lot of you know this. Luke 2, 8, that night there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified, but the angel reassured them, Don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. And you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth lying in a manger. Suddenly the angel was joined by a vast host of others, armies of heaven, the armies of heaven praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. When the angels had returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, Let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. They hurried to the village and found Mary and Joseph, and there was the baby lying in the manger. After seeing him, the shepherds told everyone what had happened and what the angel had said to them about this child. All who heard the shepherd's story were astonished, but Mary kept all these things in her heart and thought about them often. The shepherds went back to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen. It was just as the angel had told them. Now, we discussed this a little bit in a humorous way, but in all seriousness, the whole thing about the Magi, it's not we three kings, their Magi, that happens sometime later. Some say as far as two years later. Along, oh, my. Yeah, that's right. Put those magi, those kings, on a shelf for a little bit. Put them in timeout. So, <laughs> so up to two years, some say it's debatable. But they're not a part of what happens this day or this night. So just saying. Don't get me started about it again. <laughs> we'll move on. This time of year, we celebrate Jesus' birthday as we see it. In these accounts, but for as much as an emphasis as we place on it in the, in the mainstream church, in the modern church, we don't see Christmas being celebrated anywhere in the Bible, nor do we see it celebrated anywhere in the early church. We have to wait 300-ish years. See, any historical record 
of anyone celebrating or the church celebrating the birth of Jesus. And it wasn't on December 25th. That happens way later. So aside from these accounts that we're looking at today, Jesus' birth account, I want you to think about this, is remarkably absent from the rest of the New Testament. And so what you're looking at is 27 books. Right? So first four, talk about it. Then it doesn't. The bulk of the New Testament doesn't really even mention it very much. And it's interesting. Mary, after the Gospels, she's only mentioned by name in the first chapter of Acts. Then, for the rest of the New Testament, she's absent. They're not talking about her like some denominations talk about her today at all. Galatians 4.4, 4, the brief mention of being born of a woman, right? but that's not the point. It's not about Mary. Some say Revelation 12. It's debatable, but it doesn't mention her by name. And again, no Christmas celebrations. They're not talking. They talk a lot about the resurrection, and they celebrate that every week. But not a Christmas story. It's strange. And you know, it gets even weirder when you start thinking about it. You ever read the book of James? That's Jesus' brother. You think he'd know Mary. <laughs> Doesn't mention her at all. Peter, the lead apostle. No mention, 1st, 2nd Peter. John, 1st through 3rd John, Revelation. Jesus at the cross says to John and his mother, like basically take care of her. This is your mother, this is your son. And then it says that she lives with him from that time on. Not going to mention her. Amazing. No mentions of a holiday of Christmas. Now, there's probably a reason why. They knew this, Colossians 1.15, Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is firstborn over all creation. He is firstborn over all creation, his creation itself. That's the right theology. So while we celebrate Jesus' birthday this weekend, must be made very clear that we're celebrating his birth in the flesh. That's what this is. He's God, and we mustn't forget that. He always existed. If we go back to John, there's a part where Jesus is saying, whoever believes in me will never perish, but have eternal life. <laughs> and he says that he's greater than Abraham from the genealogy in Matthew where it begins. Abraham's a great patriarchal figure. The Jews say, who do you think you are? Jesus has a good answer. John 8, 56. Your father Abraham <coughs> rejoiced as he looked forward to my coming. He saw it and was glad. The people said, you aren't even 50 years old. How can you say that you've seen Abraham? Jesus answered, I tell you the truth. Before Abraham was even born, I am. Weird sentence. Well, if you know the word well, you know that when Moses encountered God as the burning bush, this is what God told Moses that he would be called. I am. Tell them I am has sent you. So Jesus is saying, I am. I'm God. They go to stone him for that. If we go back in John, let's look at this again. John 1.10, he came into the very world he created, but the world didn't recognize him. He came to his own people, and even they rejected him. But to all who believed him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. They are reborn, not with a physical birth resulting from human passion or plan, but from a birth that comes from God. He came into the very world he created, and all who believe can be born again. Through the one who was from the beginning, we can have a new beginning. We can be born again. Now, if we continue in John, 
from the first chapter, and this is a little tricky. This is 30 years later now, so we're moving ahead from like the birth account. There was a man named Nicodemus, a Jewish religious leader who was a Pharisee. After dark one evening, he came to speak with Jesus. Rabbi, he said, we all know that God has sent you to teach us your, mirac uh, us your miraculous signs or evidence that God is with you. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. Unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. What do you mean, exclaimed Nicodemus? How can an old man go back into his mother's womb and be born again? <laughs> Very literal individual. Jesus replied, I assure you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and the Spirit. Humans can reproduce only human life, but the Holy Spirit gives birth to spiritual life. Don't be surprised when I say, you must be born again. Through Jesus, we can have a new spiritual birth, a new beginning. I'm going to draw your attention to another often overlooked feature in these accounts of Jesus' birth or the beginning of the Gospels. If we look back at Jesus' family tree, his genealogy, again, there are the parts that a lot of people skip, but they tell a story. So if you know the Old Testament well, certain things will stand out to you. And I'll kind of point them out in case you don't. That's okay. And I'll point out what's going on here. So this time of year, the focus has shifted to Mary. And rightly so. She's the vessel that carries our Lord in the flesh. That's kind of important. I'm not downplaying that. But there are some other women. Elizabeth. Later we'll see Anna. We're going to look at that account. But there's some other women that very few people talk about <laughs> when we're talking about these accounts leading up to Jesus and his birth, the genealogies, the family tree. By what line? There are four other women who are usually left out, but they're in the genealogy of Jesus. Now, this, this is very interesting. Because today, right, you know, we talk about women, they're in roles of authority and all kinds of things like that. But back then, it wasn't like that. And it's remarkable because when you have the women, we'll talk about this at Easter, right? So they're, they see the empty tomb and they're, they're like the first tomb. They're the first witnesses, right, to the resurrection. That's crazy because women couldn't even be witnesses in a court of law back then. So to put them in, the Lord's genealogy is crazy enough. But let me describe to you who these women are. It's remarkable. You have Tamar. <laughs> so someone knows the Bible back there, like, oh, no, is he going to tell that story? Tamar is kind of interesting. So, yeah, he's from the line of Judah. Here's the backstory. So we're going back to Genesis. So Judah has a son, Ur. And so, married to Tamar. Just says he's wicked. He dies. So, like, the brother in this society, the brother's got to marry. Onan. Onan doesn't want to have a kid with her. I won't say what he did. Kids around. So, <laughs> Onan doesn't want a kid. So, he dies. Then there's Sheila. He's got one more left. Doesn't want him to die. So, Tamar's upset about it. And she decides to discuss her father-in-law, right? Her father-in-law decides to disguise herself as a prostitute so that he is father-in-law, right? I'm saying that right, yes. So, so that, I got it, right? Yes, good. I get all like the names, like brother-in-law, father-in-law. So I just want to make sure I'm right because when I get home, I'll get corrected if I didn't get it. So, so father-in-law disguises herself as a prostitute and sleeps with him. Yeah. And so we get... Perez, and he's mentioned, you know, they're twins, but Sarah and Perez. You're going to mention that here? Yup. That's crazy. If we keep reading, we get an actual prostitute. You know the story of Jericho. Well, the spies spied out. There's a prostitute, Rahab. <laughs> she hides them, but she's a prostitute. She's in here. They mention her in the genealogy. Ruth. Now, you might say, oh the book of Ruth. She's a Moabite. There's the rest of her story. She's from an incestuous union line. They're considered like kind of a dirty, disgusting people, the Ammonites and the Moabites. Why? You might know the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. You might know Lot. Remember the wife, Pillar of Salt? Right. 
So Lot goes away to Zoar first to hide. Then he goes in the mountains. The girls think, ah, there's no one left to procreate with. Let's get our father drunk and sleep with him. <laughs> right. And so you get the Moabites and the Ammonites. That's Ruth's line. <laughs> Then you get Bathsheba. Ooh, you know King David, right? The story of the adultery. Well, that's an interesting one. So he sleeps with one of like his soldier's women. <laughs> then he has him killed. <laughs> so he's an adulterer and a murderer. That's David. But this is an adulteress. Then comes Solomon, the product of that union. Well, not the first one dies. The first son dies. That's a crazy story. It doesn't mention her name. The other ones are named, just to be fair. In Greek, it says Uriah's. <laughs> so it, it knows that, like Matthew's thinking, you're going to know who I'm talking about here, Bathsheba. So easy to read version will say Bathsheba. That's okay, because that's who's being talked about. This is interesting. To have for women in a genealogy of that time, it's kind of crazy, but to have four undesirable or sinful women in the genealogy of our Lord, this speaks of the redemptive nature of the gospel. Right from the beginning, no matter what you've done, no matter where you come from, no matter what your line is, what this is saying to you, is you can be a part of the family of Jesus, just like these folks were doesn't stop him from getting in. And then it's followed by God coming in the flesh, becoming like us. That should blow our minds. We serve a God of compassion, one who is willing to make himself like us, to be born into vulnerability, a baby, one who understands our weaknesses. He understands our pain. He understands our fears. We serve a God who gets it. No matter what you've done, no matter what you've been through, no matter what you've come from, no matter what you've been born into, we are invited to be born again into the family of faith. That's the message. He's a God of grace, and he's inviting you to come into his light. He's inviting you to move forward. Stop living life in the rearview mirror. He's inviting you to put away regret, move forward from it. He's inviting you to come out of that shame and into the family of faith. He's inviting you to live a life of joy in Jesus. And so we have New Year's resolutions coming up, new beginnings. And so what better time to make a commitment to Christ this year? To come back on a Sunday and be a part of the family of faith. To experience something new. I talked about bickering, and that's no joke. <laughs> people who are in the church regularly, the leadership here, the people who are helping me here, they know. You know, because they're like, how are you doing? <laughs> you know, because they know. It gets rough this time of year. People are forced to see family members. They really don't want to see if they're being <laughs> honest. They're not getting along. They're avoiding certain people. And they're just, then there's politics, right? So we don't talk about that here. Yes, right? Now you're forced. It's always one, right? <laughs> and then they're getting drunk. We recommend you don't get drunk before you come to church. So usually people aren't drunk here. <laughs> and it's, it's happened, you know what I mean? We're like, well, all right. <laughs> so... All right, yeah, you, you're going to hear some interesting stories this year. <laughs> real church, real people. <laughs> I have not always been a pastor. And you're like, I know. Oh, that explains everything. We understand. Maybe you have a perfect family. Great. Bring them in. <laughs> you know? 
But maybe not. Maybe not. Maybe it's chaotic. But here it's not. Here we don't do drama. We don't do politics. We love you. No matter where you come from, we don't see race. We don't see political affiliation here. We leave that outside. That's there. And again, I'm not trying to be a Grinch about Christmas traditions. <laughs> They're not absent here because we're like legalistic or anything. We have a cafe. We feed you after church on Sundays. And if you go up there, you'll see Christmas decorations and there's Christmas carol and Christmas music going on and everything like that. This is about Jesus. This is about the word of God. That's what we're doing here. We're not mixing any of the other garbage in. That's when you get really bad theology. This is not about the world. This is about the word. That's what we do right here, all right? And then we do life with each other. If you look outside the door, we put these up. Or this is what we're moving into. Four things they did in the church of Acts. The word. They were devoted to the apostles' teaching of the word, right? They were devoted to this. They were devoted to each other. They were devoted to sharing meals with each other. And they were devoted to prayer. That's who we are. That's who we are. And I want to invite you to join us in that. You can be a part of a family. You might have a past. I have a past. <laughs> it's crazy. But no one's shaming me about it. My mess has become my message. My test, my testimony. And that's the only time anyone's going to bring it up. No one's using it against me, reminding me about it. Oh, you can't change. No. That doesn't happen here. It's not allowed. I preach those people out of the church. They're gone. We don't, we don't do the finger pointing, the judgment. That's my job, to correct the people. <laughs> but here, no, they're all here to love you and treat you like family. That's what it's about. And so what better time? A better way to start off the new year. And here's the thing. We are kind of in a vacation place. So as we close, you might be going back home. And again, I apologize about the weather. It's really, it's not supposed to be this cold here. I just, <laughs> you know, I, did, I forgot to pray about that. I had other people to pray for. I messed up. My fault. You can blame me. So <laughs> it is too cold. Sorry about that. Not great. Uh, but you may be going back to colder weather. I'm sorry. And if that's you, look, I just encourage you, if you're not already there, find a Bible-believing church. Find a Bible-believing church. Find a church where the pastor will get to know your name. Right? So now I get worried because I'm like, oh, no, I forgot their name. <laughs> when they'll get to know you. If he doesn't know you, he's not your pastor. Find a church where they're not trying to be famous, where they're not trying to get rich, where it's not about the money, where it's about the people. It's about the community. It's about the word of God. Find a Bible-believing church where it's about family. Get plugged in. Go once a week. Don't do life alone. Don't do life alone. So an encouragement? Again, Merry Christmas. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. We appreciate it. We're going to have some announcements, I think, and then we're going to sing another worship song. But in the meantime, let me pray for you. Lord, I thank you for this church, everyone who took the time during this busy holiday season and all the worldly distractions to come here and set aside the time for you to celebrate your coming and becoming like us. Lord, we love you and we thank you so much for doing all that you've done for us. Lord, I pray for everyone here that you fill them with your Holy Spirit and you make them vehicles of your grace, your mercy, and your peace, especially during the season where so many are forgetting the real reason for the season. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
Thank you.